you know, I feel uh, um, you know, it's like a deja vu all over again for 20 something years. Uh, Dr. Alof and I obviously grew up together since the early 90s. We've been uh, uh, seeing each other here in Monterey and uh, in Moscow and uh, in Europe and uh, you know, in many, many, many other countries. And, uh, uh, you know, our career paths went different directions, obviously. You know, I stayed in Russian studies here in the United States, and uh, 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 Dr. Vladimir Arlov, uh, you know, became truly a star in uh, the field of non-proliferation in Russia. Uh, he was probably in the 90s, the youngest expert. Uh, he was trained um, at Wikimor, uh, and uh, um, I believe he had uh, Spanish and English work in Latin America and then chose non-proliferation as a focus of his work and established a uh, peer center, which is very well known to um, not just to uh, Monterey Institute students, but it's uh, a very highly respected journal publication on security affairs, uh, security index in Russia. And the most important achievement of Vladimir Arlov is that he's the founder and director of peer center, you know, the premier think tank in Russia. Uh, on uh, security issues. Uh, he's editor-in-chief of Security Index and he's a member of the advisory board to the United Nations Secretary General on Disarmament Matters. Uh, I also would like to mention, because we have a uh, um, majority of our um, guests today are students, uh, he's the editor and the contributor to a textbook on uh, non-proliferation, that's the first textbook on non-proliferation that was uh, ever published in Russia, and it will be in its fourth edition now. Uh, we asked uh, Dr. Arlov today to speak on uh, uh, the nu nuclear non-proliferation and Russia's security policy priorities. This is the presentation that we're going to uh, hear today. This will be the third presentation of Dr. Arlov here in Monterey this time. Um, he is uh, lecturing, giving a series of lectures on uh, um, uh, security affairs related to Russian foreign policy. And uh, his final lecture will be next Tuesday, which will also take place uh, here at the Institute, and it will be in Russia. Uh, so with this introduction, let me also mention that our format of work today will be about 40 minutes presentation, and then Q&A without the break, the usual format for such uh, gatherings. And uh, welcome, Dr. Arlov. It's a uh, great, great pleasure to see you here and uh, to be able to learn from you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Vasilio. For this very, very warm uh, introduction. Uh, it is true, uh, coming to Monterey uh, for me is like uh, coming to my second home. Uh, and uh, I came here first time in 1992. Uh, and uh, of course, I'm proud to be associated with what is known internationally uh, as Monterey Mafia, Monterey Non Proliferation Mafia, which uh, basically not controls uh, all the decisions but definitely influences many decisions related to the nuclear non-proliferation regime and my many thanks that go to uh, Professor Porter uh, who is in this room. Thank you, Bill, for your wisdom, uh, for your courage, uh, and also for encouraging not only myself but many of my colleagues and friends uh, to contribute uh, to the nuclear non-proliferation uh, regime uh, strengthening. It is also true, of course, uh, that uh, coming to Monterey is always a challenge because when the weather is like this, I know that uh, people do enjoy it not only indoors but outdoors. And many of us in uh, Russia, and here is a trick uh, for the interpreters, know Monterey as Monterey, uh, or Monte Paradise, uh, translating from um, Russian. So, uh, I'm, of course, uh, always coming here a little bit of uh, jealous for those of you who spent a longer time at this wonderful uh, land. Uh, as uh, Professor Vasilio introduced uh, myself, um, I do not need to uh, do more of my 
her introduction, um, but uh, what I wanted to mention before I, I start my uh, presentation uh, is that I definitely speak here only for myself. Uh, I do not speak for any other organization I am associated with. Uh, I even do not speak for Peer Center. Uh, for those of you who follow Russia and Russian politics, it may be surprising that NGOs dealing with international affairs and international security still exist in Russia. And if they do, a Peer Center is one of those very few uh, remaining where non-governmental, independent, uh, institute, and here is uh, the website uh, uh, of um, uh, the institute, uh, and uh, uh, of course uh, each of us uh, has their own opinion, his or her own opinion on this or that issue of Russian foreign policy, international security, and I'm sure for what I will be telling you now, some of my colleagues and friends at the Peer Center would may put it in a completely different way. So this is a disclaimer that these are only my views reflected here are among my uh, positions uh, Anna uh, mentioned. Uh, there is also um, my position as director of Center for uh, Global Trends and International Organizations uh, with the Foreign Ministries Diplomatic Academy of Russia. Uh, this uh, also means that I do not speak for the Foreign Ministry of the Russian Federation here, and you will get it just in a minute, but definitely I do not. Um, okay, now it's time to turn on this thing. Yeah, you hear me well? Good. Uh, so, I will start with a story. Uh, that happened to me uh, maybe four or five years ago. Not this year, earlier than that. When um, I was talking to a senior Russian diplomat dealing with the issues we are going now to discuss with nuclear non-proliferation. And he told me, well, okay, let's think how should we put the case that NPT, Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, is important for Russia. That was not what I expected to discuss with him. I wasn't thinking of discussing some details of Iranian nuclear program, whatever else, but not that we need to save the NPT in Moscow from those in Moscow who do not think that NPT itself is important for Russia. First moment, I thought the task was too easy actually to do because it was so obvious that Russia, as a nuclear weapon state, is very much interested in keeping MBT not only alive but quite dynamic and uh, active. But then I realized that my knowledge of uh, the Kremlin Byzantium is not good because some people in Kremlin they were taught not necessarily at the Monterey Institute or in Gimo in uh, Moscow, or even if they were taught somewhere there, they spent quite a number of years on the east coast of the United States, being Russian officials there. And they learned from your previous administrations, specifically from George W. Bush Jr., that treaty is not necessarily so important and that maybe it's always better to not be bound by international commitments. They actually were putting George W. Bush um, behavior as an example for future Russian behavior. Well, maybe at the first moment I was surprised, today I'm not at all surprised about that. And I must tell you that there is a real battle now these days in Moscow between those who do believe that the treaties and international obligations and that the non-proliferation structure which is here today matters, and those who believe this is American-managed architecture, and this is why 
Russia at the minimum should ignore it, at the maximum should withdraw. To understand better why this battle goes on, for me it is more interesting to tell you about what is the current thinking in Moscow on the broader security uh, spectrum uh, issues and also then of course on non-proliferation, disarmament and the related topics. So that you understand what is not my logic, not your logic, but the logic of people who are making decisions or who are parties of those battles I just mentioned uh, in uh, Moscow. I will start with a description of strategic planning, which uh, goes on in Kremlin under President Putin these days and for the future. Then I will give you some idea of security threat perception, so that you understand what Russia looks as threats to its security, and is certainly projected to the topic of our discussion. And finally, I will just tell you what it means and what it can mean for the Russian non-proliferation uh, policy. Yeah, this is what is on the screen, our doctrinal documents, which are now on, which are now active uh, in the Russian decision making, though it is also true that after the Ukraine crisis, after it started, and after the Cold War 2.0 started spring of this year, of course, some of the documents are being revised, or will be revised, most specifically elements of the Russian military doctrine, though it entered into force not that long ago. Here is what I will show you what has been not necessarily on the desktop of President Putin, I don't know what is on his desktop, but definitely what uh, being planned and being projected are in uh, Kremlin uh, for the next few years planning. And here is the first thing, which people even in January, February this year, still kept very high on their priorities. Russia's G8 president, Sochi Olympics. Further on, it will be soccer, or football as we call it, of course, World Cup hosted by Russia already in the future, in the 2018. Closer to politics, though, of course, soccer is very much politics, and the Olympics are very much politics, is uh, Russian uh, chairmanship at uh, Shanghai Cooperation uh, Organization for this year and next year. Next year's Russian presidency with the BRICS. And believe it or not, we also have elections. Uh, and uh, we have our, our next parliamentary elections, the year 2016 to the State Duma, and only 2018 presidential elections. Last but not least, in uh, presidential planning, 2020 is the year where the results of Russia's development strategy should be presented to the general public. So kind of 10-year planning, which should be delivered by either Putin Medvedev team or Putin Putin team or kind of that uh, leadership. What is important here for our conversation? Of course, what is in the past rather than in the future uh, at the first place? Of course, this did not happen. President Putin was going to meet uh, the leaders uh, of the uh, other uh, G8 nations in uh, Sochi in June this year. As Foreign Minister Lavrov later commented, they just didn't want to, uh, we're too lazy to come 
to Sochi, of course, uh, the reason was slightly different. And while G7 still uh, exists, it exists outside of Russia, and those who tell me that this is only temporary, that Russia is out of G8, fundamentally misunderstand the nature of the current Russian uh, decision making. What is also important uh, that such elements as Shanghai Cooperation Organization and BRICS are here on the scene. What is less important but also important is that parliamentary elections are relatively close, which means that our parliament, which is the most uh, hardline legislature in all of the Russian recent history, would make the best to show their cases as patriots, as nationalists, and make their cases even stronger in the months to come. But still there is much time before the next presidential election, so President Putin has almost always has his hands mostly free. Russia's threat perception according to the doctrinal documents, to the Russian security strategy. Look, proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, and this is very close to the hearts of those of you who came here to listen more on non-proliferation and less on Russia. Um, this uh, is definitely in the doctrinal, in the documents, on top, on the top priority for Russia. And it was not once or twice when President Putin also mentioned that proliferation of weapons of mass destruction is number one uh, security uh, priority uh, for uh, him. Then uh, it goes uh, um, uh, increase of number and role of non-state actors, primarily of terrorist organizations. So fighting violent non-state actors is number two priority as declared in the Russian documents. Uh, number three is much more specific problems with global s stability uh, caused by the global or strategic missile defense uh, development by the United States. So very specific point compared to other more general points. And then illicit drug trafficking, which is very relevant to Russia, and cyber wars and cyber crimes. Now let us see what is here looks uh, looking like a small script, but uh, as you all know, small script, this is what matters. And in this case, small script matters more than what you have in the doctrines. And these are most recent uh, comments by President Putin. Uh, one uh, of the major speeches was uh, made uh, to uh, the Russian ambassadors. He collected, he gathered in uh, Moscow uh, in July, uh, and uh, then uh, his uh, most recent speech to the Valdai uh, Forum uh, in Sochi. Instead of addressing G8, he addressed experts on Russia there. And this is what really now very much in mind of the Russian real, not declared, but real uh, decision makers. They are very concerned of uncertainty of international situation. The word uncertainty, неопределенность, comes a lot. Together with growth of conflict potential, sharpening of contradictions, and growing chaos in world affairs. Putin does not like chaos. He likes structure, he likes stability and predictability. Number three, unilateral diktat and U.S.-made templates for global solutions. The unipolar world, in Putin's view, is simply a means of justifying dictatorship over people and countries, and of course dictatorship comes from the United States. Clearly, United States here is viewed as a problem, not as a solution for international relations and for bringing this uncertain and chaotic situation back to order. The problem with national sovereignty is also of much concern for Russia together with the attempt of those who provide diktat 
uh, to uh, organize color revolutions in different parts of the world. In fact, in Russian view, uh, there are only a small group of really sovereign countries. Russia is among them, and for Putin, this is a defix that Russian sovereignty should not be uh, diminished. Then, uh, according to uh, the official of non-compliance to norms of international law is also very high of the agenda of concerns. But look how Russian leaders see what international law means. It's not only treaties, it's also principles of truth, justice, and respect to one's partner's interests. Threats to Russian compatriots around the globe, what in Russia means представители широкого русского мира, is also another challenge which is uh, mentioned. Growing threat of extremism and radicalism. This is a much vaguer definition than the previous ones because when we uh, try to realize what uh, radicalism uh, um, and extremism can mean uh, actually any activities not sanctioned by the government can be part of extremism. And Russian legislation uh, definitely uh, cannot put you pressure uh, if uh, you think differently and if you speak differently. But if you speak differently, it can be uh, claimed uh, that you are extremist and then uh, the criminal code and all the Russian uh, um, law enforcement machinery would be uh, against you. Uh, NATO trend of expansion towards Russian borders. This is more or less traditional uh, statement, but still there. And of course, with the Ukraine situation, uh, maybe even higher or in the agenda. Then a more specific point again, many types of high precision weaponry, conventional weapons, already close to the W uh, and D. Increased probability of chain on conflicts between or with indirect involvement of major powers. This is something new. In previous doctrinal documents, the risk of conflict or war involving major powers, and Russia is definitely one of them, was more or less out of picture, out of the center of the picture. Now it is again still there. And finally, we see that uh, the Russian leadership is quite puzzled, because while it is certainly against the unipolar world and the attempts of the United States to provide the deterrent in global affairs, they also recognize that polycentric world does not improve stability. In fact, it more likely to be the opposite. And the goal of reaching global equilibrium, global equilibrium is what in his Putin mind, is turning into a very difficult puzzle. So Putin is now playing puzzles and trying to put it right. This map I from time to time show in different audiences for quite a few years. Really, you can tell me it's quite outdated. 2003, compared to very fresh data and information, why should I keep it here? Not because I forgot to remove it, but very much for purpose. It is still very much valid. It is general stuff of the Russian Armed Forces document, and I put it here just exactly as it is in Russian. It does not exist in its uh, English version in uh, official uh, documents, and this is a public uh, page, so I can use it um, uh, freely. Uh, this, uh, constant, uh, th this circles, uh, meaning uh, in most cases, sources, geographical sources of threat to Russia. Uh, the major, of course, comes from West, from NATO, the risk of increase of military presence uh, in even those countries of nature which currently do not have it. And again, it was 2003. This is exactly what is going on now to 2014. In that sense, Russian military analysts were 
probably very much correct. Then there are two circles here in the Middle East and here in uh, East and Northeast Asia. They both are very much relevant to nuclear uh, and uh, missile proliferation threats because this is, in the view of the Russian military, is major sources of threat to Russian security coming both from regional conflict, potential regional conflict, and possession of nuclear and other weapons of mass destruction, and that means of delivery by certain countries of the region, or their developed or planned are nuclear military uh, program. And this big circle, this is not a threat, quite the opposite. This is an opportunity in the view of the Russian military. This is zone of peace and stability within Shanghai Cooperation Organization. And I shouldn't remind this audience that definitely China is one of the major, you know, the major player in Shanghai Cooperation Organization. In that sense, Russian military's vision of the world, threats here, solutions here. Now, coming back to general public, this is not Kremlin uh, so, so, uh, sociological polling. I didn't uh, poll uh, it in Kremlin uh, or around. This is what Russian general public was asked. Who will use or threaten to use nuclear weapons? What states are WMD threats to Russia? This is what my institute, Peer Center, asked through all Russian sociological polling quite a few years ago, 2006. You see, United States was mentioned as number one threat, 30%. China was mentioned probably together with Iran. Of course, not everybody is so well trained to know that Iran doesn't have nuclear weapons. Anyway, it was mentioned here, and Pakistan and DPRK were going next. What is not on the screen is that more than 80% of people also indicated terrorist organizations, non-state actors, as the source of threat to Russia, which was much more important for the Russian public than the United States in 2006. This is very fresh. This is what was not done by uh, Peer Center, but by uh, Akshestan and, and uh, Foundation. This is what Russians think now. 50%, slightly more, believe that the United States will use or threat or will threat to use nuclear weapons. Not necessarily against Russia, so this is not exactly uh, the uh, full parallel here between the questions. And look. DPRK, Pakistan go much less here compared to the United States, and China definitely less. And Russia itself, uh, people do not believe that Russia will use or threaten to use uh, nuclear weapons against others. So this is Russian public perception. It goes very, very much in line with the official perception. And of course, this is mutually reinforcing figures. Russian leadership cannot completely ignore the feelings of the Russian public, and the Russian public certainly gets it from the Russian uh, state TV and other propaganda channels. What is important uh, to see when you look at the Russian security policy, foreign policy, and of course non-proliferation policy? There are five contradictions generally in the Russian foreign policy today. And when I'm saying contradiction, I'm not necessarily blaming Russian foreign ministry for that. I'm blaming more our, uh, just a, a therapist here who identifies the problem but not necessarily saying that uh, it is what somebody should blame for. But let's see. The first one. Definitely clear need for the economic modernization which was declared by uh, the former president of the Vietnam, but nothing was really done uh, here. And growing isolationism by Russia, which is taken with applaud by a significant element of the current Russian elite. Do not believe those who say that all the Russian elite has their kids in London, have their money 
and London all the time. No, they have their financial interests in Russia. They are happy to push others out of Russia. Their kids go to, go to schools in Moscow. Uh, and in that sense, this is very nationalistic elite who is happy and starving for more and more isolationism of Russia. The second contradiction is uh, between declared change of geographic priorities or structural priorities in Russian foreign policy cooperation, clearly with BRICS, with Shanghai Cooperation Organization, or geographically more with non-US Asia Pacific, and de facto still bipolar vision of the world. And this is very interesting and tricky when non-proliferation is concerned. Where United States is still seen as number one rival, but also number one partner. When you need to discuss some really important stuff, you do not call Angela Merkel. You still call President Obama. Contradiction number three. Renewed great power status, clearly it is there, and lack of capability or ability to promote Russia's interests through multilateral diplomacy. There are a lot of grand initiatives, which you probably study, uh, those of you uh, who are study Russian um, uh, foreign policy issues, or European security treaty, whatever, but when you compare the left column initiative with the right column, achieved or not, adopted or not, then you see uh, how poor Russia has been playing here. Number four, reliance on nuclear weapons, now and for the foreseeable future, and insufficient development of modern conventional capability. This contradiction is publicly recognized, is recognized by the Russian military and political leadership, and the work is on the way to correct the second part of the paradigm investing heavily in conventional uh, modern capability. Whether it would echo in the eagerness of Russia to work on reductions of nuclear weapons in the future, when this conventional capability improvement is achieved, is of course not clear. And contradiction number five, increase of importance of space warfare and cyber warfare, which is recognized by the Russian doctrinal documents and very practical documents of the Russian general staff on the armed forces, and at the same time lack of efficient diplomatic instruments to prevent threats coming from them lack of NPT for 21st century style or type uh, of a document, draft document, ambition, or even vision. Here also there is some work going on uh, by uh, the Russian diplomacy, uh, both uh, on the uh, space security issue, of course, together with China in uh, Geneva and some other related efforts, and also more and more on the cyber front, trying to push to take it from uh, ICANN, uh, taking it uh, from the current uh, internet governance to uh, a very different way of internet governance, but so far uh, these are very, very uh, initial steps, and Russia definitely is not a global leader uh, for uh, promoting those new ideas. Okay, now I'm coming to the final um, part uh, of my uh, presentation. How all these things, contradictions of the Russian foreign policy, Russian foreign policy goals, and just the current Russian situation domestically, very challenging, how they echo uh, nuclear non-proliferation and arms control. First and foremost, Russia just cannot ignore the fact and those here in the room who already were at my previous lectures already saw this uh, map, are that most of the nuclear non-proliferation challenges are located close to the Russian borders or borders of the Russian allies. Russia doesn't have many allies. Well, it's of course uh, the army and the fleet, uh, as it was said in the 19th century, but it's also CSTO uh, members, uh, mostly in Central uh, Asia. Uh, in that sense, um, for Russia and its very few allies, 
all three areas of proliferation, instability, and challenge where MPT doesn't prove to be a universal treaty yet. Uh, of course, they are very uh, important uh, for Russia. Russia simply cannot ignore it, neither militarily nor politically. This is what you all are familiar with. We've been in Monterey, with the Monterey Institute. For those who are not, these are three pillars uh, of the nuclear non-proliferation regime. Uh, peaceful uses of nuclear energy, disarmament, and non-proliferation. We can go in any order you like. The most important that the pillars should be equal and all three present. For those of us uh, who value NPT, Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty itself and Nuclear Non-Proliferation current regime. Uh, this is just uh, uh, that obvious that all sh uh, three pillars should be observed and promoted. With peaceful uses of nuclear energy, this is not uh, that much problem and I would probably not spend much time on it in my presentation and if those of you who are interested, there is a Q&A session for that. This is a map just uh, last month, uh, uh, from um, Russian export of both uh, current nuclear export and also planned nuclear export. So it includes uh, the actual uh, contracts, uh, agreements, and MOUs with the nations. Look how big and diverse the geography is. And of course, it is true that it is going on. For instance, just last month, Bolivia. Uh, was added to the list and more and more countries with whom Russia either starts construction of nuclear power plants like for instance Vietnam or Jordan or where Russia has in mind a uh, building of nuclear power plants if financial and other circumstances allow that to do so. But this is really ambitious and this is why Russia is on the forefront uh, of supporters of nuclear energy development here, this nuclear energy is of course peaceful. In that context, Russia does plan to expand its presence in places like uh, Iran. This is much more complex, Russia and nuclear disarmament. Uh, of course, uh, some of you who follow Russian developments here closely know quite well that if you months ago, that uh, Bush-style view uh, on uh, disarmament issues prevailed in Moscow. Our, even the same name, disarmament, disappeared from the name uh, of uh, the Russian Foreign Ministry Department in charge of this issue. It was uh, called before uh, Department uh, of Disarmament and Security Matters. Currently, it is called Department of non-proliferation and arms control. Just because it was said that disarmament in its current meaning is meaningless, whatever it means. But this is interesting. This is not my phrase. This is President Putin's phrase just a few days ago. Now, President uh, Putin, for the first time in many, many months, came back to the issue of not only nuclear arms control, not only to the issue of strategic stability and arms control, but also to the nuclear uh, disarmament. He said that many states, many states in his opinion, I will disagree, but he believes many states, to ensure their sovereignty want to obtain their own bombs, meaning nuclear bombs. This is extremely dangerous, yeah, sure. We insist, Russia insists, on continuing talks we are not only in favor of talks on nuclear issues, but insist of continuing talks to reduce nuclear arms. To reduce nuclear arms. The less nuclear weapons we have in the world, the better. And we are ready for these most serious concrete discussions on nuclear disarmament. Are still many people are puzzled why he used the phrase uh, disarmament, where they just slip out of his tongue, less likely he is not the type of the guy. Uh, in that sense, uh, there will be an interesting move of Russia, maybe to another grand initiative, or maybe to a very special set of steps prior to the NPT 
uh, review conference of the year 2015 to show that Russia is sincerely or pragmatically, whatever you like, uh, interested in nuclear disarmament. When it comes to nuclear non-proliferation, there are two key words which are fighting between our each uh, other, not only words, but also worlds, and also groups uh, and the Russian decision-making community, uh, those battles to which I referred in the beginning of my speech. The first element is the governance, which is to make agreements, to make arrangements. Putin used the word договариваться quite often in his recent address. For him, the solution from that house is in договариваться, in making arrangements. If this is true, he puts as examples of how people should договариваться how people should make arrangements, how it was done with the Syrian chemical weapons, and how it has been done with Iranian uh, nuclear program. And for some reason, he also mentions North Korea. I'm not sure that we have so much success there, but this is what he uh, says, that there are some positive uh, results. Good experience, he believes. But then, there is a group which called уважение, respect. And this is also Mr. Putin. So basically he represents both groups, or they are fighting, and he speaks to both of them, looking as an arbiter who will win. Or maybe he knows who will win. Or uh, I don't. Uh, and уважение uh, means that who plays the cards of non proliferation If it is international community, that's fine. If this is United States, which uses non-proliferation card as a protest to interventions, to pushing other countries like it was in uh, Libya or uh, earlier on in uh, Iraq, uh, or could happen in Syria. This is completely unacceptable for Russia. Look at this quotation to understand the, log the logic of уважение. And then Putin says, well, he just mentioned Iran, Iranian nuclear program as a good example. He says everything has its limits. It might be possible that external circumstances can force us, Russia, to alter some of our positions, meaning particularly on Iran, but may, maybe also on existing arms control architecture. He didn't mention it, but of course, uh, such issues as INF Treaty and others and others could be added here, where Russia would alter that position because of the limits are the limits. And what are the limits reached for Putin is not clear. Of course, what uh, went on uh, Ukraine uh, in February this year clearly made him furious and for a good reason, at least designedly. Russian nuclear weapons. Here, how Putin sees the situation. First, he sees that nuclear weapons make Russia strong. That ordinary guy argument, which is very close to Putin's heart, at least these days. He quoted Nikita Khrushchev, uh, and normally he's critical to Nikita Khrushchev, particularly the Crimea issue. But in this case, he believed that Khrushchev was respected, even with his own presentation at the United Nations. Why? Because Russia had nuclear weapons. So with nuclear weapons, Russia is always respected. Then it went to be weak, which is completely impossible for Putin. This is humiliation for Russia. Soviet Union gone. Uh, and Russia was viewed as upper volta with missiles, he said. What happened? Nothing good for Russia. Strong again. Russia with nuclear weapons, only with nuclear weapons it can feel strong. The bear, this is what Putin says, will not even bother to ask permission. Look, here we consider it, it is master, here in Russia we consider bear master of the tiger, 
And I know for sure that it does not intend to move to any other climatic zones, even not to California. It will not be comfortable there. However, it will not let anyone have its taiga either. So I think this is the quintessence of the Putin's thinking. Nuclear weapons are needed and will be needed to guarantee Russian sovereignty. Whatever conventional capability Russia will reach in the future. So of course, these are all a very, very interesting set of puzzles. We all experts now have. There are those battles which are very practical battles. At some point, when I mentioned nuclear disarmament in the front page of one of my uh, peer center's brochures, I was not only criticized, I would say I'm a traitor, because disarmament is not the word Russia uses any longer. Uh, but of course, those camps who are promoting more international cooperation, who are promoting are in Russia the value of international treaties, MPT included, or MPT primarily, and those who just do not care about it, they are now exactly in that very interesting dance. They are dancing together, uh, and uh, it is not clear where, uh, uh, where this dance will lead Russia to. And it is also not clear how it will echo for international architecture. Again, I'm here not to discuss European security architecture or US-Russian relations, so we can touch upon them in the Q&A. I have NPT review conference in mind, which will take place just in a few months from now. Traditionally, for many years and decades, and Professor Porter knows it quite better, much better than me. Soviet Union and the United States put aside their differences. Even in the worst times of the Cold War I, they managed to work together to uh, keep non-proliferation treaty going. In fact, non-proliferation treaty itself was concluded in the times when Soviet tanks were entering Prague. 68. Whether it would be true for the Cold War II, I would love to say sure, but I'm not sure. Thank you. Alright, so now we're beginning our Q&A uh, session. Please, uh, when you come up to the microphone, identify yourself. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Orwell, uh, for what I think really was a brilliant uh, presentation. And what I particularly appreciate is the fact that having had the opportunity uh, to interact with you for well over two decades, that you continue to have new and very interesting uh, uh, perspectives to share with us. And so I, I greatly appreciate your, uh, your coming to Monterey and sharing your, uh, your views. I have lots of questions that I could ask, but I'm going to limit my, uh, my initial questions at least uh, to two areas. One might actually uh, interpret your discussion of the debate today in Russia over the direction of Russian <coughs> non-proliferation policy as encouraging. Because the debate suggests that there are in fact multiple players with different perspectives. And so my, my first question is, uh, can you say a little bit more about the nature of this uh, deliberation? Uh, to what extent are there actually meaningful uh, contrasting uh, players, including representatives from the traditional national security organs, such as uh, the Foreign Ministry, the Security Council, uh, the Defense Ministry, uh, Rosado, perhaps, 
uh, or are we really observing uh, more artificial uh, debates which are designed to promote a, uh, an outcome that may be uh, you know, known in, in advance? Uh, and my, my second uh, question has to do with what you've already identified as a very important, long-standing uh, experience of cooperation uh, between the United States, first the Soviet Union, and now Russia in the, the realm of non-proliferation, one might also add more recently in nuclear security. And yet we've seen actually preceding the events in Ukraine some retrenchment in the Russian position in terms of engagement with the United States on nuclear issues, both in terms of initially uh, indicating there was no interest in any immediate follow-on negotiations in the nuclear arms control realm, uh, a, a winding down of uh, of engagement uh, in cooperative threat reduction and related programs in Russia. And then most recently, and in some ways most strikingly, the um, a boycott of uh, one of the planning sessions leading up to the Nuclear Security Summit and the announcement uh, by, I think, actually Sergei Kisiak uh, uh, a day or so ago that Russia, in fact, did not plan to attend the 2016 conference. So my question here is, uh, to what extent are we still observing kind of tactical maneuvers? Because one can point to the recent return of a highly enriched uranium from Kazakhstan and Poland, just I think a month or so ago. Uh, the newspapers suggest that Russia may still be playing a, a constructive role from the U.S. standpoint in terms of Iran. To what extent does that represent kind of an outlier or uh, and, uh, and a tactical move? Or really do we have to begin to ask have we seen a fundamental uh, reassessment and rejection of the value of collaboration with the United States uh, on non-proliferation issues? Thanks. Thank you, Bill. Uh, these are, of course, uh, important set of questions. Thank, thank you for the good words. Uh, well, uh, the easiest part here would be uh, to tell you whether we debate which is going on, which are, of course, very schematically described here, uh, scheduling. Mm, whether it is a kind of artificial thing, uh, whether uh, it is uh, a real thing. Well, you cannot imagine how real it is. And I'm not sure whether debate in this sense is a good thing or a bad thing. Maybe it is a good thing that the door is not closed. Uh, there is another problem. Actually, under President Yeltsin's times, it was not uncommon when different Russian agencies or ministries had their own opinions and their own policies, non-proliferation issues uh, included. It was very Byzantium-style rule, uh, and not necessarily Kremlin. Kremlin was under 100% of control. Today, of course, it is different. President Putin and Kremlin are, are under control of 100% of the situation over there. And it's just uh, both uh, general managers and micromanagers are, and uh, uh, the, 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 this is what should be recognized, are, having said that, we even cannot imagine what the war is going on between those structures and the official dome you just mentioned. And it is not the war of one group against the other, again, uh, for for the sake of the presentation, I simplify the camps, putting them into two. There is war of everybody against everybody. Uh, and uh, actually, of course, it is paradoxical that at some point, Rosatom, just to give you one example, not to be too general here, um, Rosatom is promoting in the middle of Novorossiya uh, crisis, just exactly after uh, the uh, Malaysia Airlines uh, Boeing was shut down, 
uh, Rosatom still promoting continuation of Russian-Ukrainian nuclear ties. Because Rosatom believes this is important for the future of Russia, and no secret, it is important for the Russian nuclear industry. But also to keep Ukraine at least partly in the uh, Russian uh, sphere uh, of uh, nuclear energy uh, influence. At the same time, Russian Foreign Ministry torpedoes of the Rosatom effort, saying that this is betrayal of the Russian interest. Of course, this doesn't come to the front pages of the stories again, because everything is micromanaged uh, in one place in Moscow, which in this case is maybe good news. Uh, but uh, it is true that currently, when uh, in Russia to be a patriot, to be proud of your country means that you should blame somebody else, and this somebody else is on the other hemisphere. So just if you blame the United States for all the bad things, uh, so you um, gain the scores uh, automatically. Not necessarily for top people in the foreign ministry, but for people at the mid-level. For, for them it's just an excellent moment to rise, because they can catch a Rosatom spy who works for Ukraine and for Ukrainian interests. And all these things go all around the spectrum, and not necessarily that the defense ministry is giving by. The defense ministry's analytical positions and general staff's practical positions are unified, and so on and so forth. So this is a very multiple mm, uh, conflict uh, within. Our, in theory, I would say yes, it should produce some very interesting and bright results, uh, but uh, it can uh, produce also very, very damaging results. And uh, this is the answer to the second part of your question, Bill. Um, I'm afraid that I'm right, uh, that Russian isolationism to which I referred to was not caused by Ukraine. Ukraine was just another drop, maybe a very big drop, maybe the final drop. Uh, but uh, it was starting earlier than that. It was expanding. But it was started, starting much earlier uh, than Ukraine, and Ukraine was a very nice proof of those Russians, uh, including in the leadership, but also general public, who believe that uh, isolation is, is a solution. Um, and Ukraine was just a very good proof to their fears, uh, concerns, uh, and uh, predictions. In that sense, yes, Russia uh, decided that it will not be part of the uh, ISTC, International Science and Technology Center, already quite a few years ago. Russia said, we don't need that. Well, maybe the time was out for the ISTC. Do you need institutional memory, expertise of the ISTC, which is gathered for those 20 years or so? No, we don't. We're not interested. What about global partnership? Well, it corrupted quite a few of our officials. Some of them are in jail, some of them are overseas. Uh, that was the response. Yes, this is part of the picture, but very small, because the grand result of, of the global partnership and CTR was much larger than enrichment uh, of uh, half a dozen of Russian senior officials. It was actually a practical result in improving security. This is ignored, and a smaller picture uh, made the only picture. This is a problem. People are not well educated. Our parliamentarians, believe it or not, I'm sure here in the United States it's a completely different situation. But in our legislature, uh, people, not all of them, are highly uh, educated. This creates uh, another uh, part uh, on, uh, of the problem. Now, in that sense, a Russian uh, de facto withdrawal from a number of international mechanisms started definitely before uh, the uh, collapse uh, of the uh, G8. Collapse of the G8 could be even excuse for those people who didn't want continuation of uh, that 
cooperation uh, in those formats, maybe uh, they will learn how to do it better in the BRICS format or in the uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization format. I'm sure uh, they will, but maybe they'll learn. Thank you. You know, you, you, you point out all this interesting thing in terms of general changes that takes place that Ukraine obviously emphasize and enhance into almost a dramatic thing. But on the questions of the NPT non proliferations I can say the situation that, you know, you may not truly collaborate or you show indifference or you show dismissal. But it's different from what is the real alternative options? Are they, do they really want to, to let it unravel? I mean, what is the, the, the other options available? I mean, after all, I mean, I mean, so it's one thing to, you know, to, to, to have, to make a point to the United States within the larger, broader context of relationship. But it's another thing to let this, this regime go away. And I don't think that's their interest under any circumstances. So you yeah. can explain that. Thank you, Aaron. No, no this is the, the definitely the difference between uh, near-term uh, planning uh, and tactical moves and the strategic thing. Or if you think that everybody thinks strategically on the MPT or and the Moscow decision-making community, this is not exactly right. They think exactly about those periods of time I have indicated, 2016, 2018, maybe 2020, and they know that by that time NPT will not collapse anyway, at least NATO limit will not collapse. So for them, the best option, again, for that camp, who is not interested in legally binding solutions, in obligations. Of course, it's not killing the NPT. It doesn't make any sense why Russia should kill the NPT. No, this is not the point. The point is US-style behavior uh, of the conference 2005. For those of us in non-proliferation community who follow uh, those review conferences, that was a disaster. Nothing happened, very sad mood. Our people in Moscow said, look, we should just take no commitments, no obligations. We can play those discussions all around about Article 6, about other things. We have some good things to promote related to internationalization of nuclear fuel cycle. No, nobody's against that. Nobody's against sending a delegation to New York. Of course not. But uh, action plan, even such a weak action plan uh, as it was in 2010. Well, some people already say, why that guy who headed that Russian delegation who is now not with us, why he agreed to that action plan? We didn't need that. Even that, what for us is modest, modest thing. I said, no, we should really have hands free in that sense, why we need the final document? Let those Arabs discuss all those things about the zone. It's not our business. It's not our problem. It's an interesting thing, actually, how Russia will proceed with um, talks with Iran. Uh, and uh, for me, it will be, if not necessarily the litmus test, but at least some sign uh, where it goes. We discussed it partly actually in the seminar with some of the uh, people who are here in this room. Uh, in fact, um, Russia has choices now. Uh, one of the choices uh, is actually to continue working on the uh, agreement, on the comprehensive agreement, blessing it, saying, yes, we also should be proud because, well, in part at least, it was based on the lover of plan. It doesn't matter, but um, Russia definitely uh, had blessed it from the very beginning, including uh, bilateral uh, Iranian uh, 
the U.S. Uh, uh, I'll say my secret rapprochement in the beginning. Uh, the second scenario can be them trying to do, let pretend that we are supportive, but in fact they will not reach anything, particularly after midterm elections here. Iranians would be even more suspicious to a future administration of the United States. They would not like to repeat the mistakes uh, that North Korea almost did with the Clinton administration in the mid-90s. Uh, in that sense, it will not grow anyway. It will not produce fruits anyway. So Russia should not torpedo, but Russia should do not much at all. And the third scenario, which is also on the table, is, well, quite interesting, I would say. Uh, it is now time to explode all those talks. And now to use all Russian internal resources, which were sleeping for so many uh, years, just to explode all that. Because then it will be good for Russia. Iran will not be back on the market uh, with uh, its oil. Uh, Russia will not lose Iran anyway. Uh, even uh, in the contrast, it can strengthen relations with Iran. Uh, and uh, then uh, you have more cash, particularly when the economy is really struggling. Uh, and uh, you lose nothing because you finally tell Americans that without Russia, you can do nothing, or very little on Iran, because, uh, of course, uh, more and more people in America now believe that they can discuss things with Iran now bilateral. Russia. Russia is not needed any longer, so Russia wants to send another signal. This is for Ukraine. <laughs> this is for Ukraine. Uh, and this is for Ukraine. Uh, and just to be very frank, I don't know what of this, I mentioned there are not two, but three scenarios, what of these scenarios would prevail. My guess, very humble guess, would be that scenario number two. Basically, we don't torpedo, but we don't help. Because it will disintegrate anyway. <laughs> it, it will not grow anything. Uh, but there are some people uh, quite activist in our decision-making community who say, no, no, no. No, Americans and Iranians are going and doing something. They're in the true, we should not. Uh, Ignore uh, the rapprochement, we should uh, now play our role to stop it. So we'll see. Thank you for a very interesting and enlightening presentation. Um, I know that in the Russian think tank community and within the research community, the idea of multilateral disarmament has been very popular. And how to achieve... Uh, multilateral disarmament? Yes. Mm -hmm. How to achieve those steps towards this goal. And I, I'm just wondering if this idea is still alive, or is it disintegrating where the Putin administration ever shared with this goal? Thank you, sir. No, I, I think this is uh, also part of that uh, larger uh, battle uh, I just uh, described. Mm, because where you can measure uh, the uh, behavior of countries related to multilateral disarmament. Of course, one place is the first committee, uh, but uh, another place uh, is Geneva Conference on uh, Disarmament. Uh, whether Russia wants to see a conference on disarmament dead or alive. No, more likely Russia wants to see a conference on disarmament alive. Uh, does Russia, is Russia ready to bring some fresh energy to conference on disarmament? I'm not sure at the moment. I think that Russia is very interested in certain elements on uh, multilateral uh, discernment, uh, if you like, agenda. And this is definitely not FMCT. FMCT is something which Russia can deal with, but uh, absolutely when I started to just test the level of interest 
if you like, the level of testosterone in the Russian uh, politicians from the FMCT was close to zero. It was not negative, oh, it was something, okay, whatever. Uh, when it comes to uh, outer space, when it comes to space security, when it comes to already existing Russian Chinese initiatives here in Draft Treaty, or other ways how we should work with the Europeans here, with others, even with the United States. Yeah, I see people are really interested and engaged. So probably if it were just completely Russia's choice, Russia would simplify the work of the Conference on Disarmament by just putting aside all other issues, which for Russia are not counterproductive but just boring, uh, and put uh, uh, security uh, of uh, the space uh, uh, on top of the agenda. But things are not done, this is not multilateral diplomacy, right? Uh, uh, things are not done uh, that way, and definitely are not done that way uh, in uh, Geneva. Uh, so uh, I can uh, expect uh, that, and I mentioned that, that if the decision is made that Russia should really be engaged in non-proliferation and disarmament matter, rather than to disengage or to show complete disinterest. If the decision is made like that, we should expect some Russian return uh, to our initiatives uh, at the conference uh, on disarmament uh, or around. Whether it's a healthy place to show your activism or not, this is uh, another uh, issue. to uh, also uh, thank you again for speaking with us today. Uh, my question is on uh, the Russian Federation uh, perspective or bureaucratic perspectives within the Russian Federation on the utility of the P5 process within the NPC context. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, this is a good question. Uh, actually, uh, for Russia, probably one of the uh, highest values within the, let's say, broader NPT process is uh, the P5 uh, consultation process. This is something which meets the Russian interests, non-proliferation interests generally. And I refer to them, Russia wants to uh, actually remind itself and others that it is in the very elite club, and P5 is the good reminder. This is why actually NPT definitely matters for Russia generally. Not everybody <coughs> in Moscow realizes that's the prime. Anyway, now P5 is a good forum uh, to look together at the things and to come up with a unified position to the NPT review process, and just to exchange uh, opinions, to check the things under the closed doors of the nuclear weapon state. Uh, this is why, even in the heat uh, of the uh, Crimea slash Ukraine uh, crisis in April this year, uh, Moscow, of course, sent a delegation to the T5 meeting. Well, but it's also true that it took place in Beijing. I will put a our small our question mark what would have happened if the place would have been geographically different, particularly would have been in the United States. Uh, but still I think Russia would have sent uh, its uh, dele uh, delegation uh, there. Having said that, well, I participated at least in one uh, meeting of the P5 as a member of the Russian delegation, so I have my own, let's say, inner uh, um, view uh, of the P5. Look, if you know something more boring, where you really need to share all your email, are, and still you have time, this is exactly the place. The most lively thing 
there in when Chinese for the hundred and first time discuss the glossary uh, of definitions and then even Americans and girls says, yes, yes, this is so good. Because really, compared to other nonsense discussions, this is something uh, practical, though you hardly can sell it uh, to uh, people outside the DeFi. Are, and of course, there are some other uh, relatively useful things. Uh, for instance, what uh, to give you together as P5 should uh, boycott or whether you should participate. And of course, the issue of humanitarian approaches is another good uh, uh, test case for that. When at the beginning, P5 coordinated that effort within itself and just even the Brits, all right, all right, but we want to, uh, okay, but we will not this time. So it, it was a good coordination effort, very useful for Russia, because uh, the game of the D5 is always that Russia doesn't want to be the last, doesn't want to be to blame, because when we do something, it was the case also in other uh, four when P5 is involved, like, um, uh, UN Security Council resolutions on Iran, uh, when uh, Russia's uncomfort came from the notion that China can vote for the sanctions and then Russia would be the only one to blame. China could feel a very similar thing and sometimes when disarmament is concerned, of course, uh, three of us, uh, Russia, China and France, look together at each other and no one wants uh, to be the only one are in the corner. So that kind of circle where there are no corners is quite helpful. Although uh, I'm not sure it uh, has much sense uh, in my view. Thank you, Professor Orlov. I have two questions. One um, about the about Rosatom and the Russian civilian nuclear industry. Uh, do you think the European Union sanctions are going to affect um, Rosatom? Because I know that in, uh, in the summer, the Czech Republic pulled out uh, of a deal with Rosatom to build a facility. And finally, do you think the, uh, the Ukraine uh, during the NPT is going to bring up something about the Budapest Memorandum? Thank you. Okay, let's start with the Budapest uh, Memorandum. Our, our, I think that and the last uh, prep call uh, on to the NPT, uh, one we had uh, in uh, New York uh, this spring. Uh, the issue of Budapest Memorandum was mostly played down. And we discussed it actually with some of the Soviets, as I think we have a common view here that it could have been louder. Or even for the Russian delegation, uh, the head of the delegation planned to come not the first day uh, for the press conference, but then uh, realizing that it may be the Ukraine issue already in the first day to change his plans. Which means uh, that uh, Ukraine uh, issue was not that major irritation so far. Whether it will change uh, for uh, the NPT review conference, as it may, I would say still it would not be a top priority issue, definitely not compared to Article 6 related issues and to the zone pre weapons of mass destruction. And I think this is what um, Russia are, is looking for uh, that uh, let's just. Uh, put all the attention uh, towards the Middle East related issues and uh, just as it happened in all the previous four, uh, the discussion on other issues would be covered the schedule. Uh, again, uh, I'm not sure this exactly will be the case because uh, Russia has its own uh, explanation of the vision uh, of the case, uh, some of us in the non-governmental community in Russia have their own explanations um, of, of that, uh, but uh, I'm sure uh, that uh, states uh, who put their signatures there, including the United States and UK, may have their own plans here and not necessarily laying down the issue. Um, 
And of course, it will be a game uh, closer uh, to the MPT record uh, started in that sense. Russia may want to use the P5 discussions just to make sure that it will not happen in the Sherpers. Uh, um, on uh, Rosatom um, and uh, the sanctions. So far, so good. Uh, and uh, people with Rosatom are, are not as much concerned on the sanctions, particularly because most of their business trips go to the places where sanctions do not matter. They're not European Union and not uh, to the United States. So uh, most uh, of the potential uh, contractors, and they showed it um, on the map, and partners of Russia are, are in are East Asia, Southeast Asia, Middle East, and potentially in Africa and Latin America. So all those markets which are still there. Um, your question is more specific about Central and Eastern Europe. From what I knew uh, from my uh, Rosatom uh, friends and interlocutors, I would say a month ago, they felt a lot of political problem with their current and potential markets in Central and Eastern Europe. There was not the legal context so far, but more a political one. So people didn't want to stop, people wanted to postpone, to freeze. And definitely for Satan that was very bad news. Of course for Satan, uh, at some point for Satan saw one of its major markets uh, in UK. Uh, currently the situation is not that favorable at least to my knowledge, for the UK uh, either. Uh, again, uh, I could be not familiar with the specific legal implication uh, that happened in recent weeks. I would not be surprised if they did happen, but I would not comment on the things I do not know. Good afternoon, William Andrich. My name is Vyacheslav Romanichev. I am the research associate of uh, National Nuclear Research Institute, uh, MIFI, Moscow, and here I am the CNS fellow, Eastern fellow. Mm -hmm. So I have, uh, th uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for your lecture here. And I have two questions for you. So you mentioned uh, the one, one of the contradictions in Russian uh, politics as um, between reliance on nuclear weapons from the one side and a development of new conventional weapons from the other side. So development of conventional weapons maybe is not so surprising. And in addition to that, um, nuclear, both strategic and tactical weapons, nuclear weapons, I mean, are also being modernized. So what do you can concretely mean by reliance on nuclear weapons? And um, do you think that this reliance is something to make Russia, as you uh, call it, renewed great power? And do you, do you agree actually with this concept that Russia now is renewed great power? And the second question uh, will be connected with the relation between the US and Russia. So as soon as you're here. And uh, from my point of view, and as I see it, there are three um, intersections where uh, these relationships, uh, the relations, uh, can be useful. Uh, there are world terrorism, nuclear sphere, and business, of course. So, um, do you agree with that? And maybe, like in, in some more spheres, uh, Russia and the USA can cooperate, because you mentioned like. Um, that in, when something serious happens, Russia uh, all, always occur to and refer to the USA. Uh, but maybe it's not like really like uh, it's not in each and every case right, because 
as soon as um, Russia now maybe is a like, growing economy, um, so the USA, it's, for, for the USA perspective, it's not a very reliable partner. Thank you. Uh, Vyacheslav, right? Right. Yeah. yeah, thank you Vyacheslav for your question, and of course say hi to uh, Mephi. Uh, I have very good memories of my years uh, teaching at the uh, MA uh, program uh, there. Unfortunately, those people who built that uh, program at the university passed away, like uh, Professor Krishko. So I hope that Mephi now re uh, energizes uh, and uh, wish uh, all the best to the university. Uh, on your um, two questions, uh, reliance on nuclear weapons. This means that nuclear weapons is viewed as the key, is viewed as vital for providing Russian national security. Well, you can work on further nuclear reductions, but still you give substantial arsenal for the reasons of uh, preventing military aggression for the reasons of high prestige internationally uh, and uh, for uh, the reasons to make your public opinion happy. And of course, uh, all these points are questionable because some may say it's high prestige, uh, others may say uh, it's uh, unfortunate. Uh, some uh, may say that public is happy, others may say that public is unhappy. Uh, so far, uh, Russian uh, public uh, feel very comfortable with both the number of nuclear weapons and with uh, how Russia deals with the issue. Russian public would probably be critical, skeptical about new agreements with the United States. Or oh, really, uh, you should change the course uh, in uh, the propaganda TV channels uh, about that and maybe in two or three years, Russian public will find out that it's really a good thing to work on the reduction of nuclear weapons and that new start treaty should be followed by uh, something else, but definitely it's not the case uh, for uh, today. Uh, what uh, is important here uh, is uh, the qualitative side. Uh, of course, uh, Russia, as well as other nuclear weapon states, particularly as the United States, it works uh, only on um, uh, improvements of the quality of its uh, nuclear arsenal. It works on diversity uh, of its uh, nuclear arsenal. Uh, it invests uh, heavily uh, in uh, nuclear weapons. Still, uh, compared to investments uh, in our non-nuclear defense sectors, nuclear weapons prove to be relatively cheap. And this is also important. This is also it helps sell it to the public. Public uh, easily associates nuclear weapons with the strength and pride of Russia, but uh, actually the figures help prove that in the times of economic uncertainties, but even the military budget, even the defense budget, may be questions, questions uh, for the next uh, three or four years because of the uh, recession, economic recession in Russia. Then nuclear weapons may be, uh, again, that easier, cheaper, and uh, attractive a solution. So it's a combination of very practical military capability uh, and the uh, PR uh, factor. I have no doubt that uh, Russia uh, is uh, in the great uh, power uh, club, uh, and uh, this uh, definitely uh, there. Uh, and your question about um, um, cooperation, lines of cooperation with uh, the United uh, States. Uh, as of today, uh, there are very few. Quite a number diminished uh, just uh, uh, in recent months. There were such things which looked like obvious that I would ask forever, like cooperation and space programs. Even there, uh, there were. Uh, uh, reduction. So everything is a fact. Our nuclear uh, cooperation, nuclear security cooperation uh, proved, uh, well, uh, people uh, were saying it is not 
affected for some time, it is affected as well. Um, looking uh, at the isolation and tra trend in Russia, uh, and uh, of course uh, at the skepticism on Russia here uh, in uh, Washington, um, mm, I do not see a bright future for uh, nuclear uh, security uh, cooperation uh, either. But there are certain uh, lifelines, if you like, or lines of cooperation, which I think may uh, survive even uh, this time of the uh, Cold War. We discussed uh, already possibility of, uh, of that uh, uh, non-proliferation discussion on the top on the most urgent non-proliferation issue between Russia and the United States, regardless of the geography of, of those issues. Uh, again, uh, Iran will be a good test case to see whether it will stay uh, or even that will uh, disappear or will be completely diminished. Uh, there is the second element, uh, is uh, cooperation on financial crimes. Surprisingly, that this is what goes on. And Russian delegations come to Washington and actually find um, that they are almost alone among the Russian delegations coming to Washington these days, but they do do their job, Russia and the United States cooperate on uh, that of, uh, financial um, uh, task uh, force. Are, it's not as easy as it was before, but actually even uh, the discussions uh, on uh, the um, proliferation uh, element built in uh, the part of uh, uh, go on between Russia and the United States on the level business as usual for business is uh, almost as usual, which for me uh, personally is surprising, but uh, well, uh, it's, it's good it goes on. And uh, last but not least, uh, cyber security. Russia and the United States have uh, a unique uh, agreement uh, on uh, cyber security uh, cooperation, which uh, was signed between the two countries just a few days be before Mr. Snowden decided uh, to tell is interesting sagas, first from Hong Kong and later yeah, from Moscow. Uh, but we have that agreement still in place. Uh, and in that uh, sense, uh, it's an interesting non-attack fact. Uh, now uh, Russia uh, is going on to have a similar type of non-attack cyber pact with China. Uh, and uh, I think this is very high priority for Russia. Uh, so far, uh, it is against the Russian interests to break that back to the United States. Uh, it doesn't mean uh, that it is cyber peace between the two countries, but uh, non-attack uh, on the major cyber warfare issues uh, is viewed uh, as high priority in Moscow. Uh, it is hard for me to say how it is viewed these days uh, in uh, Washington. Uh, but uh, from the Moscow perspective, this probably should not be killed. Thank you.